okay, we're going to use the next part of the strap to make another bracket, and it's going to go from this coil mount bolt, and of course this end will be bent over and reamed out to accept a 6 millimeter bolt, and then it'll be rolled and folded at an angle so that you'll put the other sheet metal screw up through here. Obviously the ends, you just bend them straight up, like say if this were the piece of metal, and you bent the end straight up, and that would be where the end is slotted out. In the end, or the center of this, one hole over from the end, we're going to need to do a bend that deflects it at an angle. So say if this were your strap, and you bent it right back on itself, it would end up like this or like this. If you wanted it to make a flat stock 90 degree bend, you would fold the paper at 45 degrees so that when it's done your flat stock would look like this. What we're going to do is we want it to head up at almost a 30 degree angle so if you can see this, we're going to fold it so that it goes like this. And then the end will be bent over and put through the bolt that mounts the ignition coil in place. And then from the bottom up will be a screw that comes into the next mounting tab on the choke actuator. And the whole purpose of doing it this way is I want to demonstrate how to do it with a simple bench vise and it's nothing complicated. You notice where I cut the metal. Right here there's a very small bridge across it so we're going to start with the fresh end and this loop is going to be bent over. So this one is where we want to start the complicated bend at. And all it is, it's not rocket science. If you picture, we're going to clamp it in the vise at an angle like this, and then take this and just fold it over. And this is like I say, not anything that has to be deadly precise. Because this metal is flexible. So once you get it in place, if you have to tweak it a little bit, you'll be able to tweak it a little bit. Okay. I'm going to go ahead and bend this. And like I say, you won't need any complicated piece of equipment do the installation of this kit with. Everything can be done with simple hand tools. In this case, I'm just going to be using a vise and a ball peen hammer. So right now I have finished the step where it was clamped and I've rolled it halfway. So now I'm going to lay it on the top of the vise and just start tapping this down gently. As you'll see, it's coming around.
Okay? So now you see the angle that we have created. And when you do this, start in the middle of one of the slots. Trust me. It needs to be in the middle of the slot, or as close to the middle of the slot as you can get. I would like to have made it to where it was a little bit straighter, because the way it is, it's going to bow it just a little bit, but fortunately this, flex or this metal is flexible enough that it will allow that. Now what I'm going to do is bend the end over where it can go through, or excuse me, so that the mounting screw can go through this tab. Incidentally, the kits are going to come with two of these pieces of metal instead of one. The only reason why I'm going to include two is because if you mess one up, you'll get another bite at the apple, so to speak. I encourage you that even if you do mess one up, to continue with that one just as a practice piece, though, so that if you mess up this end, totally destroy it. Try this end to do the fold so that that way you've only destroyed one and you still have another fresh piece of metal to work with. And there the bolt will go through to mount this in place. This end will be trimmed off as you'll see in a moment. Fortunately, there's not a lot of pressure applied to this. All it's used for is just to move this choke lever back and forth, which as you can see, takes very little effort. I'm going to test fit it. And like I said, this angle here, it would have been better if it had been slightly further out but this will be acceptable. So I'm going to put the bolt through here. I'll go ahead and trim this end off at this point. This screw will go up into this mounting tab on the actuator. Try not to drop the screw. If you do drop it, it will probably land inside the recoil start mechanism. If you're lucky, it'll fall all the way through to the mounting tray. But if you don't drop it in the first place, you don't need to worry about that. And I'm just putting this in enough turns to get it roughly in place.
Okay, so now I've got both my six millimeter bolts. Tighten down. I'm just going to take a pair of pliers. Bend this slightly. Back in place because I bowed it. Tightening it all down. Let me go ahead and grab this phone call. Okay. Before we tighten this last screw down, we're going to go around the other side and make sure nothing's shifted. And again, sight from the end of the corrugated area on this. And the actuator for the choke should be as close to a straight line as we can get. And this shifted just a little bit as we were bolting it on. That looks much better there. And now I'm going to come around and tighten up the sheet metal screw. Actually, it shifted a little bit as I was tightening. So now the choke actuator is tightened down, and you'll notice it does move just a little bit, but also it only takes a few ounces of pressure to move that choke, and the force is going to be this way, not up and down. So now, we'll come over to this side again. What we're going to do A 1 16th of an inch hole in the top of the choke lever. We want to drill the hole right at the end of the corrugated area. So you'll see the corrugations right here. So we want to drill the hole. In this line, from this corner to this corner, about halfway through. And it'll only be a sixteenth of an inch. when I drilled that hole it looked like a piece of the plastic. Oh, here it is. It just landed on top of the breather hose. This is the piece of plastic that came out of the choke lever when I drilled it. Just make sure that that piece of plastic does not end up in the carburetor bore where it could stick in the choke plate or worse yet, in the throttle plate. So now you'll have a 1 16th of an inch hole running right down through the top of the choke lever. Then if you come around to this end, you'll see a small notch in this plastic heat deflector where it's indented to go into one of the mounting screws. We're going to drill another 16th of an inch hole just this side of this divot. Don't go too far up this way because then you'll notice that the choke will act like an over center latch. And the whole purpose of this hole is to attach the choke return spring. So again, this is going to be a sixteenth of an inch hole.
this is the actual spring that will be used for the choke return spring. The whole purpose of using this fine a spring, it's going to go to a stainless steel wire that links into this, but that way the whole thing can protrude out through the choke cover without creating an unsightly mess. Viewed from the outside, it'll look totally stock. And that's kind of what we're after. Kind of mess with people's heads a little bit. You'll notice that the ends of this spring are a full loop. And I'm going to use this spring for illustration. But you notice how this one comes around in a hook. Those would continue all the way on around and overlap the bottom slightly. All that does is gives you just a little bit more strength on this. So on this, if you come around this side, what we want to end up with is I'm going to show you on this one first. I'm going to start the hook from the back. That way it'll go in and then loop around like this. If it were started from the, this side, it would hook like this. And I want it to hook like this so that it's much less likely to come undone. So as you'll see now, which way is the glare the least? With the flashlight or without? No like difference. This? Okay. If you can see this, you'll notice that the spring, the tail of it, is all the way up here instead of the tail of it hooked into the plastic, which gives it a lot more overlap. So now, we'll take this spring out because it was just for demonstration. and use the actual spring that we're going to use, which is far more difficult. Again, we're going to hook from this side, and it'll roll on around. A pair of really small needle nose pliers will help with this portion of the job. What we need to do is get the lead of this hook around behind the plastic. step one. So now you can see that we've got the tip of this piece of wire is behind this black plastic and now we need to thread it through the hole from the other side. So now you'll see it's threaded through and now we're going to rotate the spring over to here. Now you'll see that that loop goes all the way around and back to the spring itself, which creates very little chance of it coming apart when the generator's running accidentally. And now what we're going to do is take a piece of stainless steel safety wire and run it from the linear actuator over to the choke linkage and then continue on about another inch.
That is possibly as good a place as any to take a break for just a moment. Okay. Take a piece of stainless steel safety wire included in the kit and just bend it into a loop like this. You'll notice that there is a loop at the end of the choke actuator. Go ahead and feed one end of this through that loop and just pull it out. Try to form this around the end of that plastic loop as neatly as you can. Make sure that the choke is in the full open position and that the actuator is fully extended. You notice that's retracted, that's extended. And note where this hole lines up with the choke fully open and the actuator in a fully open position. Right where the hole lines up is where you want to stop twisting it at. But we're going to take it right even with the hole. If you have the safety wire pliers for this, go ahead and use them. If not, you can take a pair of vice grips and clamp it just the way I did, holding the choke actuator with one hand and twisting the pliers with the other one. Go ahead and uh, twist your piece of wire. And then recheck your gap. This can go one more twist. So with the actuator fully assembled or fully extended and the choke in a fully open position, I'm going to pass this straight down. So that you can see that the actuator is extended now and the choke is indeed open. I want to make a loop this side of the choke that is large enough so that the choke can move back and forth without it catching on this tip. The easiest way to do that is with a small pair of needle nose, bingo, right here they are. Small pair of needle nose pliers slide in it right next to the choke lever and start the twist. I'll pull the pliers out so you can see what I'm doing. I'm just creating a gap so that the choke lever does not become restricted. You can see, if you look at the choke itself, that would be closed and that would be open. Okay, so this gap is big enough. Now we want to create another loop. So what we're going to do, put a large loop in it here and either grab it with vice grips or safety wire pliers and then we're going to put the needle nose pliers right in here to create another loop and then twist this end up. So we've effectively now got a loop right here and that is the loop that the other end of the spring for the choke return spring is going to hook through. 
the choke return spring is a whole lot easier to latch into this loop than it ever was into the plastic. You take another spring. This is the exact same spring as what's used there. What we would do is push the whole loop through this and move it over and it will engage. But we want this tail. I'm just using this spring to demonstrate it with. But if you look at the way this is wound, you see that the spring comes around and forms a loop. So what we're going to do is we're going to push the tail into this side and then we're going to push this loop through the loop in this piece of twisted safety wire. So step one, if you view it from the top now, you'll notice that the safety wire comes in at this angle and leaves at this angle. And that'll be permanent. You see, go ahead and watch it from the top. And now, what we're going to do, let me get a little bit of room in here so I can do this. Now if you take a look at it, you can see that my loop from the spring is fed through the loop in the safety wire and the tail of the safety wire goes right through the spring. Now you may need to take the tail of the safety wire and just bend it a little bit by hand, whichever way it goes, so that it does not jam on the coils of the spring. Okay, this one fortunately is not jamming at all. It was just pure luck that I got it aligned dead straight. But now, as you can clearly see, the choke will pull it shut when you engage the starter in a choke. The generator will start, then the choke will release, and the return spring will pull it back open. When you're using the recoil start, if your battery is dead or you just want to use a recoil start to mess with people's heads, you'll push the choke to the closed position and pull the recoil rope. And I can demonstrate that on this one over here. Put the cover back on. But as you can see, this one is the same way. You close it and the return spring opens it. So with my thumb, I close it, and because this generator is small and lightweight, you have to hold your hand against the generator when you recoil start it. So what I do is put my thumb against the, the choke and then pull on the recoil start. Or if you wanted to, you can put your finger against it and hold on to the cabinet like this. But let's face it, when this thing's electric start, it's a whole lot more fun. It's a whole lot more fun to just use the electric starter. Okay, this is probably as good a place as any to take a break. Okay, on this, I noticed it was a little difficult to see as to how this goes together. So picture this loop right here is the additional loop that we made for the spring to pass through and the choke arm from the carburetor would be right here. What you're going to do is notice on the spring that it comes around here and then goes into the loop. We're going to take this tail and push it down inside the spring and we're going to rotate it. We're going to push this loop of the spring through Easier said than done. La 
lot easier said than done. Okay. So now you will see that this loop of the spring is engaged in this loop of the safety wire and right here where my finger and thumb are would be the choke linkage right here so that now it's not under any tension but it will pull and that is your return spring mechanism hold the carburetor in place with my thumb so it'll pull it shut like if I grab the choke actuator pulls the choke shut and you can see, see the spring right here hold the carburetor in place and that pulls it shut next step is just going to be to put the air box back on the installation is just the opposite of the removal You've got two nuts and one bolt that hold it in place the air box slides onto the two studs that the carburetor was positioned over and the two nuts are all 8 millimeter incidentally This air box is plastic, so none of these fasteners should be cranked down hard. This is the breather hose, and it just slides on this fitting on the air box. Fortunately, Honda was real clever and made it a black hose on a black air box with a black heat shroud behind it. I don't know if that makes it easier or more difficult to see. Now, let's see if I can get a screwdriver in here. And what I want to do is move the choke closed and open again by pushing on the actuator. That way I can make sure that nothing is binding. So now the choke works perfectly well. If you were trying to use this, like some people who have contacted me with uh, cell phone companies wanting to use this in their cell phone towers as a backup. The gray wire would be, or excuse me, green wire would be positive. The blue wire would be negative to pull the choke shut. So of course you're going to be putting the blue and the black to the negative terminal of the battery and the green and the red from the starter motor the positive terminal of the battery that would then energize the starter and the choke so if you wanted to play with it you could actually electric start this generator at this time but what's the point in having an electric start unless you have a wireless remote control to go with it that's probably as good a place as any to take a break again the next step on it is going to be the electronics and I'm just going to put some tape around the front of the control box and all this is for is to protect it protect this cover from getting scratched by me when I pull the electronic cover
control cover is just held on by four screws. slightly it makes it easier because there's a ground strap right down here that tucks into a notch in the plastic cover so you lift up on it as you fold it out and it gives you the room to fold it out right here is the ground strap right down here able to see that when you get it apart. Okay, this is the wiring harness and radio module and I noticed that the box of kit is getting emptier and that's a good sign. That means we're getting close to being finished. You'll notice that the radio module has Velcro on it. go ahead and put the radio module into place. Take the corresponding piece of Velcro that comes in the kit, pull the back paper off of it. This is genuine Velcro. It is not a uh, cheap alternative. So the glue that they use is really good. You'll get one shot at this. Be careful. It's going to go on this area right here, because that's where the radio is going to stay. What I do is I take this edge, and I butt it up right against the front cover, and then I fold it back so it's stuck to this surface here. Like I say, you get one shot at this, because this adhesive they use is really good. Okay, so there's the area that the radio is going to go into. There are three bolts that hold the inverter module in place against the front cover. Those three bolts are going to need to be loosened up. That'll allow us to put just a little bit of gap between the front cover and the inverter module, which makes it easier to put the radio in. And it also makes a larger gap for the switch body to be passed through. facing it. Then the bottom one on the left side. And then there's one directly in the center. The top one on the right side does not need to be loosened. do not need to come all the way out. They just need to be loosened. A little bit of a trick to getting this in there more easily. I slide a business card between the two halves of the Velcro. Then when I slide the radio module down in here, then I pull the business card out because then the two pieces of Velcro lock together. If you just try to slide it in there, you're going to have your work cut out for you. So right now, I'm going to take the radio module and slide it right down between the front cover 
and the inverter. And now I'm going to pull the business card out of the way. And now you'll see there's a slight gap between the radio module and the inverter module that's necessary because when you tighten down the bolts, the uh, inverter gets pulled up against the cover nice and tight. You'll notice there are several portions to the wiring harness. The two relays go this way, and then the rest of the wiring harness just temporarily tuck it up behind the spark plug lead. It doesn't go there permanently. This just helps you understand where everything is going to go. This portion of the wiring harness is going to tuck in to the front cover assembly. The easiest way to do that is to separate the on-off switch from everything else because the on-off switch is rather large. I've soldered everything in place and that's why you need to pull this front cover or the inverter module loose because that way there's just enough room for the switch to be passed through that little gap. I felt that it would be easier for people to do that than to be able to solder to the back of that switch because the switch is rather small. Okay, it's downright tiny. Then we're going to pass the red and blue leads with the open ring terminals on them. And those are going to be used to turn the outlet on and off eventually. Then we're going to pass the black lead, which is going to be used to charge the battery. And then the two yellow leads, which are going to be used to control the economy mode. Pass them through this little hole, hold them out of the way, and then we'll go ahead and tighten the inverter down into place. probably see by now that's why I put the tape in place to try and avoid scratching the cover. If you're working on an older generator you're probably not too concerned about a couple of small scratches but if you're installing it in a brand new one the first scratch always hurts the most. Okay, so now I've got the control harness passed through this little gap, and this is probably as good a place as any to take a short break. Okay, the front of the generator has a 12 volt DC output, and because we're going to be putting a starter battery on this, we want to be able to charge the starter battery. So we're going to tie the uh, starting battery into that 12 volt output. I've got a diode in the circuit so that if you shut the generator off and you have some kind of a DC load plugged into this 12 volt outlet, it won't kill the starting battery by drawing the power from the starting battery. It'll only draw power when the generator's running. So at any rate, there's a red and a black wire that we fed through that hole in the harness when we were routing all the wires through. On the back of the DC module there's a black wire and that black wire is where we're going to solder the end of this black wire. And then there is a white wire with a red tracer and we're going to solder the end of this red wire to that. Let me go ahead and slide the insulation back. There are heat shrink sleeves that Honda has put on to both of these and you just slide the heat shrink sleeve back slightly and I just use a pair of needle nose pliers nothing fancy
And all I'm doing is sliding the heat sleeve back, or the heat shrink sleeve back. I'm not taking it completely off. Okay, so now I've got the sleeve back out of the way. I'm going to go ahead and strip about four to five millimeters of insulation off of the black and the red wire. So then what I'll do is I'll tin the each or the end of each of the wires. I solder the red wire on to the red with a white tracer first because that one's harder to get at than the black one. The black one is going to actually, it's going to seem easy after you get the red one done. To do the soldering, I use a small temperature controlled soldering gun. If you do not have a soldering station like this. Let me go ahead and answer the phone and we'll pick it up in a minute. Okay, if you do not have a soldering station like this, I do sell ceramic pencil type soldering guns. The ones that I sell have a standard 20 watt output and you push this button on it and it momentarily goes to 130 watts. That's why I like these better than the standard 20 or 30 watt one. But let's go ahead and solder these. And hopefully we can get this done before the phone rings again. I'm just going to tin the ends of the wires first. Now on the terminals, on the back of this 12 volt outlet, there's a fairly large steel lug that comes out. So it takes a little bit longer time to build enough heat on that to get it to solder. So just be patient.
out if you want to zoom in on that. So we have the red soldered to the white with the red tracer and black soldered to black. Now we move over here, take the two yellow wires and you will see on the back of the economy mode switch there is a red wire with a white tracer and a red wire with a yellow tracer. Unplug the red wire with a white tracer from the back of the switch. You'll see one of the yellow wires has a 0.187 connector so it plugs on where the original wire came off. The next wire we're going to cut this connector off, strip a little bit of the insulation off and crimp it to this wire. Hopefully we will get this done before that gentleman calls back with more questions. Okay. That's done. Now, on the back of the switch, you'll notice that there are three pins on each side. What I've done on this side is I've taken the very end pin and the middle pin and folded them together and soldered those together and put one wire to it. This pin I have simply soldered a wire to. So now position it to where the double pinned wire is facing up. That way switch up will be on, switch down will be off. And that should make more sense to you just like a light switch. On the front of the panel, what I do is right next to the division line between the gray and the black is drill a 3 16 inch hole. Now what I'm going to do is start with a 7 30 seconds hole or you can start with a 1 8 or something like that just as a pilot hole and then go to a 3 16 
On this switch there are two small nuts, a small friction washer. Go ahead and take it all off. Pass the switch through the hole. Put the friction washer on. careful not to strip these nuts out. They're really, really fine. They won't take a whole lot of torque. And just snug that down. And that's probably as good a place as any to take a break for a moment. Okay. The next step will be the outlet control. So what we're going to do is loosen up this screw and take the original red wire out of the way. You'll notice that there is a jumper that connects the plates behind these two screws. And this is real common in electrical outlets. What we're going to do is remove the jumper and then put these two wires on so that the electrical current will go through the relay so that we can turn this outlet on and off by remote control. So we're just going to pry this jumper out a little bit we can get a hold of it with a pair of needle nose pliers and then break it off. And these are designed to break off very easily. There's actually a groove already cut in the back sides of these so it doesn't take a whole lot of effort to break them. This screw used to have the original red one. We're going to put our red one on first. And then the original red one over the top of it. And tighten down that screw. And we'll loosen this screw put the blue one on, tighten it down. Then we'll have a good look. Make sure we're not pinching any wires or anything else evil. And simply slide this panel, I say simply, yeah right, back up into place and we'll tighten it down. like so. I should have had the screws over here before I pushed it into place. The screws that go into this panel are the only four screws that look quite like this.
by now you're seeing full well why I put the tape around the bottom of this. Okay. So now we've got the radio in place and the wiring that goes into the control box. And if you did this just right, you'll notice that there is a gap between the radio module and the inverter module. Not a big gap, but it still counts. Of course, I use a business card with a shameless advertising plug for myself on it. Okay, this is probably as good a place as any to take a break. Next step is going to be to go ahead and hook up the rest of the wiring harness. There are two red wires. One red goes to the starter motor. The other red goes to the linear actuator for the choke. And two blacks, starter motor, choke. And then a black with a ring terminal. And the black with a ring terminal goes to the ground. So I'll go ahead and do that one first. black wire. That goes to the black wire on the starter motor. And just push it in until you feel a snap. The longer red wire goes to the red wire on the starter motor. And again, push it in until you feel it click. Then the shorter black and the shorter red go to the wires from the choke actuator. The blue is ground on retracting the solenoid, so we're going to plug the blue into the black. This wire is positive, so we're going to plug that into the red. And again, you push those in until you feel a nice audible click. Route the wires so that they're not going to fall into the recoil start mechanism. The kit is going to come with plenty of tie wraps or zip ties, whatever you prefer to call them. Go ahead and fasten them in place securely. relays that come with the kit. The relays are identical. This one is the starter relay. Go ahead and plug one relay into this socket. This socket is the relay that controls the outlet. Plug the other relay into this socket. Just zip tie them to the cage for the recoil start motor. You can tie the wiring harness anywhere you want as long as it's clearly out of the way. You got four more wires left. You'll have a black with a connector on it and a red with a connector on it. Those go to the battery. You have two additional black wires 
and these are used to kill it with. So if you come around the other side of the generator and attach to the fuel selector valve is a little micro switch. You follow the wiring Here is the micro switch pigtail. You'll want to unplug this harness. What we're going to do is solder one of the black leads to each of these two wires. So when you connect these two wires together, it kills the engine. So that's what it goes through the radio. The radio has a relay mounted inside it so that it can connect these wires together. What I'll do is go ahead and pull the tape off of the, the harness so I can slide the sleeve back out of the way. And that way it will expose just a little bit more wire to work with. The wire will require a terminal tool or a very small screwdriver to move the tab out of the way. terminal tool, this would be the proper one to use. If you just prefer to use a really small flat blade screwdriver, you can use this. What I'm going to do is remove one wire at a time. Just going to depress that little tab, pull the wire out, and then we'll solder one of the black wires into here. And this is probably as good a place as any to take a break while I warm up the soldering gun. Okay, we're going to take the two black wires that do not have anything on them I mentioned earlier. We're going to run them right along the top of the control box here. Right next to the inverter module. What I'm going to do is strip about three to four millimeters of insulation off the end of each wire. The wires are interchangeable because all it is is a momentary contact switch that connects the two wires together to kill the engine of the generator. Go ahead and move this. Once you solder the joint, just make sure that there are no fine lines in it. That would indicate that you had moved the wire while it was still cooling. Or 
if it tapers in real quick right where the joint is that indicates a cold joint both of which are likely to break quickly so then now I'll go ahead and put the first wire back into the multi connector You'll see whenever the terminal comes all the way to the tip of it, it's a little bit tighter fit. Okay, it's a lot tighter fit than when it came apart because there are two wires that are trying to go into that area. And just check it and make sure that it doesn't pull out on you. That would be the soldering job. Now this wire plugs right back in to the original connector where it unplugged from. test run this, I'm going to put some of the brackets back on. It gives it a little bit more stability. Not a whole lot more stability, but a little bit. Incidentally, this bracket uses one of the shouldered Phillips head screws. The upper end snaps into place. It's held firmly by the outer housing screws when you get ready to put it together. On the other side, I'm going to go ahead and put the airbox lid in place. Now what I'm going to do is round up a battery and cables for it. We'll take a break while I do that. Okay. I'm just going to do a quick test on this before we start going any further. Like I stated earlier, the black wire is ground, the red wire is positive. So I'm going to take these two jumper wires and hook up a battery to it.
the radio is not powered up right now, the switch on the front would turn the radio on. At this point, I'm probably wishing that uh, I had tested this off camera to make sure that it all worked correctly. But here goes nothing. Button number one will crank the generator starter motor over. So, let's go ahead and try button number one. And it cranks over. The linear actuator for the choke is over here on this side. And this way we'll know if we got the tension on the return spring correct. If we got too much tension on the return spring, then we'll have to lengthen the loop right here. If we don't have enough tension on the return spring, we'll shorten this loop right here. But when we hit the start button, we should see it choke also. And it's choking now. So at this point, you would want to call your wife, girlfriend, brother, or whatever, and have them come out here and see your progress so you can show off for a minute. While you're waiting for them to get here, I'm going to go ahead and explain how to do the fuel tanks. The kits that you order from me will not have a fuel tank in the generator itself. However, if you're doing your own and you wish to put a fuel tank in it, I'll show you how I do them. It is more of an art than a science, and I'm not very good at art. What you would do is connect a hose from the output port on the fuel tank, connect the other end of it to a vacuum pump. Now this is just an air conditioning vacuum pump. Then you hook an air line to it. It is then pulling a vacuum on this tank, which is trying to squeeze it shut. You'll control the amount of the vacuum by opening and closing the vent. When you move the vent to the off position, that closes the vent, which puts a tremendous amount of vacuum on the back of the tank or front of the tank. If it's starting to pull in too quickly, you'd start to open the vent. The whole time you're doing that, heat the tank with a master appliance heat gun or whatever kind of heat gun you have. The area that needs to be collapsed is going to be starting from the very center of the tank this portion right here and all the way up the front. So what I do is I start heating this area right along here to have this portion pull in. Because if you heat the back first, that'll allow that to dimple in and then it suddenly starts to get complicated at the end. But if you start right here, and that's a flat surface, and that'll start to pull in a little bit. And then go around this corner. And this corner is one of the first things that I usually blow out uh, incidentally, I'll let you know that it takes me at least three tanks that I ruin before I get one right. And that's why I'm not doing the tanks in the kits that I assemble. If you're a lot more patient than I am, you'll be able to calm down, slow down, and heat it very slowly and regulate the vacuum very carefully. If you do burn a hole in the tank and blow it out, congratulations, you're in good company. I've blown a lot of them out myself. But at any rate, you'll start heating up the back of it and close this vent and it'll slowly pull that in and then just start working your way around and pull the whole thing in because you're going to need this area of the tank is going to have to pull all the way in eventually to where it actually drops under the fill neck just a little bit. Because if you look at where the starter motor is versus the fill neck, so this area here is going to be sticking out, but all this is going to be collapsed into the tank. And that's why I say it is definitely more of an art than a science. And I'm not very good at it. You notice I just explained how to do it. I did not attempt to do it because there's no point in showing you how to ruin one in front of a camera. That should just about do it for now. We'll take a break and then come back with the battery box installation.